Okay. And, and can you also consider releasing the smaller end scale um, speakers as a separate item? Because the, the uh, two of the end scale uh, replacement board members have got the round speaker, which is yes, the really. machining. The others have got the rectangular or the oval. Oval, oh, right. Yeah, we were listening on that, so I believe the Empress is listening to your requests. It's been processed, processed, and we should have an answer for you. So, yeah, uh, there's, there's, the, the thing about locomotives is they come in all shapes and sizes, you know, N scale, HO in particular, and there's a lot of uh, combinations that, you know, take a lot of different um, sound enclosures. I mean, it, it's a nightmare, but yes, having a, a Remember, sound decoders are not our primary business. We've done this to support our customers who wanted an end-to-end -end solution. So they didn't want to be able to call up tech support and have the tech support tell them, well, that's not our sound decoder, go call them and you get this finger pointing. So we do have a number of customers who understand that it's a uh, medium performance decoder for a fair price, and they like the fact that if it doesn't work, we are settled with our giving them a, a satisfactory answer versus telling them to call somebody else's tech support. So it's, you know, people, some people make purchasing decisions based on that, being sure that it's in one family. Not everybody, but there's some people who prefer that um, background. Any other questions? Go ahead. 4,000 series or 400 series bugs still hang up with new bugs. just lock up. Yeah, I think I, think I need to get some more background on that. Yeah. Yeah, do you have the latest code in those? Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, there's a number of things that are happening that we're uh, tracking down, so I, I imagine we'll have, we'll look at those issues as we find them. And the good news is they're IPLable, so if and when we find any particular set of combination of, of events that cause some issue, we, as long as we can identify it, we can patch it and fix it and get it out to the field. So, you know, as we find things, as we find little Glitches, we will fix them. Okay. AJ, it's not a glitch. It's not a little glitch at all. No, no, I mean, I'm just saying, in terms of, it's a big glitch, then we'll find it and we'll just fix it. Let me give you a little background. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, I was one of the lead people in a large club, a medium sized club, okay. that was converting from DC to DC. Okay. So we converted. And we went with Digitrax because. The radio was better than NCE. Okay. Today, all of my NCE friends are laughing at me because their radio works and yours doesn't. We cannot have a reliable radio operation on duplex. I okay. have tried it on many different <coughs> layouts, not just a single layout. Okay. <coughs> the duplex will not stay up if you have a large number of users. If you have one or two or even four or even six users, you can quite often run for two or three hours and have no problem. But the but the radio just stops listening. Well, we've seen a number of issues in the last, how long have we had duplex out? Three years, two years? And, you know, we're, we're vexed when we hear somebody's got a layout or whatever, they have trouble. First off, our first line of defense is uh, tech support. They'll, try and get the information in the background. And we've seen in the last you know, number of years, we've seen a number of situations where we've actually resolved it and worked out what's going on. There's a good example of a club, I think it was in Tennessee or Kentucky, and they had it running fine, and all of a sudden it would just go to hell in a handbasket, nothing would work, okay? And they got frustrated. I mean, yeah, they got really frustrated. We spent a lot of time with tech support and back and forth testing things. We finally found out what the problem was, and what was happening is an area where they shared a pole transformer with a welding company on the same leg, okay? And as soon as they knew what was going on, what was happening was the welding currents, I mean, these are industrial welders, not just you know, little backyard things, and they were putting so much noise back on the common leg of the transformer that it was going into their property and they had no in input filtering, which got into everything, okay? Wide band noise, and it flattened the radio. So as soon as they, we found out there was a sensitivity, I believe they put a UPS on the system. It's worked flawlessly since that was fixed. So that wasn't anything we did to the DD402Ds or the UR92s. We had a code update about, what, nine months ago, a year. We had an issue with um, names getting changed in the system. 
And that was a simple glitch. Once we got the information, we fixed it within you know, two or three days. So we've had a number of things we've gone through and fixed. You know, we have maintenance releases on code that are problems that we can really identify and track down. We had another gentleman that had a bunch of, um, I guess, fluorescent lights, a bunch of wires hanging down. And he swore up and down that you know, it didn't work at all. And somebody else actually finally said, we've had this in a large club running beautifully for years, what are you doing wrong? He went over there and took a look and said, this is not right, this is not right. He went through it and they were fixed. So your particular instance, you know, if you talk to tech support and we can't resolve it, then we've got an issue that we would take on. But generally there's four or five items that you can work on and today we fixed them all. Now there's probably some other little thing in there that we need to look at and we will solve it. Once we can, if we find an issue that um, is consistent and we can characterize it, we will fix it. But we have a lot of layouts, big ones, running dozens of throttles, not a, not a, not a hiccup. Anybody here got a large layout running with a lot of users and they're, and they're perfectly happy with Duplex? Anybody here with a, with a layout with Duplex that has trouble? Okay. Hmm? Right, I think again, have you, what, what level of, of discussion have you had with tech support on what your issues are and how they're occurring? Um, I haven't personally talked about that before. Okay, I think that's the first step I'd request that you actually well, discuss it. I'm sitting right next to David Park. Okay. Okay. You know David Finish. Mm -hmm. Okay. I work on David's layout, I work on other Democrats' layout mm -hmm. in the San Jose area. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I get my input through David. I haven't talked to them myself. But I've been working with people like Frank says, I've been working with, you know, a lot of smart people. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're not solving these problems. We've gone through all the various things that everybody says you have to do. And the bottom line is, uh, you know, if you have eight or ten users out there, you've got a couple hours, and then you start having problems that go bad. We're getting, they're getting better, okay? But we still have problems that just, they just stop responding. You know, they, they don't do anything. You push, you push the button, nothing happens. And the only fix for it is pull the battery, put it back in. Mm -hmm. By the way, a power switch on the throttle would be a nice thing. So, okay. I've got, a, I've got a switch for it that you can install in your throttle, in your cases that you have one. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. But now we come with a solid state power management. <laughs> <laughs> I asked this question in a walk. When was mobile? Is that a yoga? Was that yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So what do I tell them? The truth. What's the truth of this one? <laughs> You're never gonna get a better. Our uh, buddy's looking for solid state uh, power management. Will that be true? And we're listening. We're listening. We're listening. We're listening. Oh, okay. Okay, we have another question. Yeah, we don't do that. Okay, what do you have? I've got a 144 sound decoder and I put it into, it's got the plugs on it, and I put it into the new locomotive uh, speed on DC without the decoder, the locomotive is 50 steel miles an hour forward. Okay. Put the decoder in, it becomes 5 miles an hour forward. And we went through two decoders with my supplier, so uh, yeah, the all kinds of CVs and everything we could think of. Yeah, the, the concept of analog mode conversion in decoders is great in theory, but of course, until you have enough voltage to run the decoder, it's not going to work very well. So, I'm, I'm hearing you're having trouble with analog mode conversion, is no, that what you're saying? No, I can take the decoder out, run the locomotive to DC, maybe 50 scale miles an hour, forward. Okay. Plug the decoder in, sounds great. 
speed immediately, forward top speed is five miles an hour. Okay, that's, um, Dave, do you have any input on that? Sounds like a bad decoder. Yeah, that's a bit. On the second one. Yeah, I think one thing you could try is, depending on the uh, armature inductance of that motor and that locomotive, you could change CV9, I think you could change to 0 or 255. 255. 255. That'll lower the uh, frequency, and that will actually, uh, typically, where you're running um, a high inductance motor, the, load, the current through the armature gets very constricted or very reduced at the high frequency, because the default, it comes out of the factory at about 20 kilohertz. If you drop that down to one or two kilohertz, it'll be a tremendous difference in torque, and that will run your speed back up. What's the locomotive? It's the brand new Fox Only Seat, Is that a different motor style there? It's a, it's a little bit different motor. I need yeah. to take it on top of that about it. Um, we've already had a little conversation about that, so. Yeah, the, the easiest way to fix that um, torque fall off of the frequency, which is the physical characteristic of the motor, it's nothing the decoder can do about anything about. Basically, we have to drop the um, pulse width frequency. Change, change CB9 to 255 is what you need to, to try. Yeah, that'd be a first test, and that generally will, will make it pretty snappy if there's an issue with um, inductance on in the motor. It is a motor issue, I believe. Okay. Anybody else? Hey, Jay, can we wait a second while I change tapes? Okay. DT, Okay. The DD400, um, the upgrade on the DD400 is changing it to the 402 series. No, there's been no changes. That product is where it's at. And if you wish the new features of the 402, we can in fact upgrade there for you. So we can change a DD400 to a DD402. So it adds extra things, I forget what they are, but there's a n number of extra things. You get 28 functions and, you know, whole grab bag odds and ends. Okay, we have one more question, I believe. Okay, go ahead. side scan because you get to this place like this and um, you're going to see probably a couple of channels chewed up with Wi-Fi minimum. We only have 16 channels available and you know sometimes you'll get very solid traffic and a lot of people are there with laptops and stuff and surfing and doing downloads and stuff so uh, we saw that in uh, I guess we did the first public showing of the DD402s in Louisville and we had a couple of channels that were not usable just totally unusable. So we did a site survey and we picked the widest channels and it worked fine. We had, I guess, 109 throttles running. We had, um, would have been probably a dozen or two DD400s. We had another dozen or so DD402Ds. Um, there was a whole lot of every throttle we've ever made running on the layout at the same time. So, yeah, there's always, uh, we, we've seen sites where they are very noisy. They've got a lot of background Wi-Fi networks, and you know we have to cooperate with the other networks. We don't generate a lot of traffic, but the other networks can do a tremendous amount of high-duty cycle traffic. Okay, go ahead. Question: Is what a servo motor is now being used in the hobby? Is it a up to a proprietary person like myself to try to develop an interface so that the local that will communicate with the servo? Oh, you're talking about servo motors for switch position? Yes.
Okay, when you say servo motor, are you meaning like a little model aircraft RC servo motor? Yeah. A servo system, not just a motor. Yeah, it's a servo. It's, yeah, it's a servo. servo. motor is controlled by a servo board. Correct, yeah. Um, a memory, a programmable memory that then I can program the up speed and the down speed independently. Yeah, we, we've been requested that we'd have something like that. I believe somebody in uh, Taiwan did one about five years ago. They did a uh, servo motor driver. I believe that. The local could communicate with local naturally to use your computer programs. Yes, that's correct, yeah. I've never found one on a market, though. I'm not sure if they ever released that. Yeah. I believe that as well. I've seen a couple do that, so yeah, maybe we can dig that out and let you know. Yeah. I think you reinvent the wheel since it's been Exactly. Okay, so is that what you got? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, on the leads, um, on the uh, Indytrack Explorer, the leads was tell us that a peculiar problem. I'm hoping maybe it could be solved, maybe it could be solved since we were gone. We had several different uh, radio throttles and uh, UR91s, and they all work well except for uh, UT4R. Uh, which worked fine on at least one other layout, and he brought it back for his own layout, but only work at a distance of around three feet. Anybody have any ideas of why this is so? I think maybe you want to talk with Dave and go over what the issues might be with the DD4, UT4R, I believe. So basically, it was too high a power, or it was causing a problem with the reception, is that what I'm hearing? Well, apparently all those other radio throttles of different types work. Mm -hmm. 400, I guess 300 work. Uh, the UT4Rs only work when they're very, very close. Uh, yeah, that may be, uh, yeah. At distance, in another a call playoff somewhere else. Yeah, well, I think we need to adjust that one, wouldn't you say, Dave? Yeah. Well, again, just contact Dave would be the best thing. Okay. We can resolve that. Like to, uh, whoever, whether they have the boss, the solve it for. Yeah, we can solve that. Okay, anything else? Steve question. Steve. An adult mode, how many can you handle? Um, 256. Very durable. There's enough average range for that. What about bandwidth? Um, I was concerned about the bandwidth. So if it doesn't keep the network occupied, it's only connecting and sending the packet and the message back, and then it gets off the network. So, and it's, and it's changing its frequency when it does that. So. Assuming you don't have a lot that's using the same channel, you, you could get quite a few routes connected. Well, you also going to have a bottleneck, going back to your question. The local net backbone rate is, is a fraction of what the 802.11 modulation schemes give. So they're going to send little chirp packets and they're going to be way slower going across the wired part of local net. So I don't suspect that will be a, a problem. Okay. If your question is, you know, can you have 400 throttles hooked up and doing a little bit of traffic, yeah, you could, I guess, but I guess it, the number of IP addresses is 255, yeah. Well, I was just concerned that it would be a case where five would work, seven wouldn't. No, I, I've, from the suggestion I've had with Steve, it looks like you know the uh, stack sizes, the resources available on the little modules are uh, adequate for probably a dozen or two. Oh, yeah, so uh, we, would, we would expect that that's a reasonable number. Okay, I think we've... Yeah, a okay. question. Um, generally, my PR3 works pretty good, and you know, I'll use it occasionally to hook it up and get the interface caught up and um, download some sounds. But sometimes, I'm not sure if I'm doing things in the wrong order, I'll go set some CDs, and then I'll think I'm downloading the sound in here, when you now play it back, nothing was downloaded. And I'll find that I gotta go reset some CDs. Um, and I don't know, maybe the lesson I should learn is uh, when I boot it up and it was made the connection, it's reading things, it just download the sounds without using it to change any CDs. I don't know. I, 
Again, we haven't used it enough, but this is a problem that's come up a number of times. And normally, by recycling it or re resetting some of the CVs, I, I'm always able in the end to download the sounds, and it works pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, some of the uh, mode changes where you're changing from running a uh, sound stream down to some of the CV programming, there may be some issues there. There's a number of worker threads and a lot of uh, things going on inside the box, and each operating system has a different way to, you know, shall I say, each computer running, say Windows, which is what's running under, can have some severely different uh, latencies and scheduling between the different threads. So it is possible, because they're asynchronous, to get a little bit out of whack. So if you get some problem, the best thing is to reconnect it, and as you say, if you be changing modes a lot, you can get into some pretty squirrely stuff. I haven't seen it a lot, but I know that if there's an issue, you just uh, reconnect and it clears everything up. And it's a more of a Windows issue, because we're trying to do a lot of things in that box, a lot of different types of processes running through a single COM port. Even though it's USB, it effectively looks like a COM port. And Windows didn't do a real strong job of that, so it can be a child, and the best solutions, as you suggest. And that seems to have Every time. I've, I've had a cat effect in the last five years. I think I found by resetting the CVs, you've got a reset button there. It just kind of problem goes away. Well, that depends whether the, the decoder got confused or the PR3 got confused over the USB interface. So there's a possibility of problem both places. The software has actually been remarkably solid. It's run across a lot of different versions of Win98. We've been running under Win95. We've run under XP. we run under Win7 and it's kind of all work, so it's actually a brutally simple piece of code. It's, it's, it doesn't make any fancy footwork, and that's why it seems to work quite stably across a lot of different platforms. And I'm talking about Windows platforms, not um, you know, across multiple computer platforms, but basically, uh, if you have something squirrely, generally focus on that one task, run it, and it generally works all. That's what I've seen. Any other questions? I think we've achieved a little. So anyway, come to the booth. You got other questions that come up, sir? Okay. Well, anyway, you can obviously come to the booth for the next couple of days and talk to us and bring up any other issues you have. And as well, um, I guess Zayna wants to know what things you want. Solid state. Oh, solid state power control. Okay. I think we got two people here want that. That's good. What else? You want? More speakers, I believe I heard. Anything else? Obviously, we're going to address the, UI, the DD402 issues with uh, radio duplex. What else? On the uh, readback on the programming track, uh, sample the um, functions and see if they're all working. Sample the functions, if they're all working. In terms of sound or in terms of wired function leads? Well, yeah, it's an output. I guess technically it's possible, but we'd have to know that you've actually put a, a function, a lead, load on the lead, and we'd have to be able to detect that. So that's um, probably a little bit more problematic than the sounds. Particularly if you're starting to talk about um, LED light loads, which are way less than incandescent. So some of those current loads would be quite tough to read out from a motor. So the NMRA standard designed, I think it was a 60 milliamp current difference typically. 60 milliamps difference, and you'll have a lot of LEDs that only have you know, 20. So I think on the face of it, it would be a pretty tough thing to do. So unfortunately, you're back to manually, okay, let's look up the decoder and let's try it and see what works. And it's a really good idea anytime you get a new decoder is just check it out on the bench, make sure it works. We run everything through a computerized test facility, so everything is theoretically 100% tested, and we've had a pretty good run of luck. It still doesn't mean that you can't have infinite mortality because we changed to a no lead process, which is a lot harder on the electronics. Okay, that's just a known out outcome of running a no lead process. The extra 10 or 15 degrees centigrade causes a greater number of infant mortality events. That's just pure fact. It's throughout the consumer and also the, all the high-tech industries found that uniformly. So, yeah, we'd rather be doing lead, but of course we're in California here, so I can't talk about lead anyway. <laughs> so basically, I don't watch that. Anyway, go ahead. Am I going to have to continue to use a booster like the PT100 uh, with my digitrack effort to 
The PTV, whose is that? Is that a soundtrack? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that seems to be the most popular fix that I see from people. Um, I had to put one of those in. Is that for sound decoders or for? Just uh, to read back CDs on the programming track. Uh, who's decoded? Is it a certain program? Uh, okay, are you talking about running Digitrax decoders or QSI? Um, actually, uh, if, if I have a tsunami, if I have a tsunami for yeah, I think yeah, the, I think the reason they did that was because some of the uh, command stations are a little sensitive, right? And that's the correct answer. Yeah, they they built a little program, what they call it, a reback boost or something, and that's the right answer to have because that'll be. Another thing is going to remember that a lot of these sound decoders use way more juice than a regular decoder. A regular decoder can operate on five or ten milliamps of track current. The tsunami, in fact, once Steve used it, pulls at about 100 milliamps at about two to three volts. And even if you invert that down from 12, that's still that big current draw. And so your quiescent non sound load is greater than the difference of the MR8 specified for the um, AC current. <coughs> my recollection. So we can wind up the current, but the trouble is if you're testing more sensitive decoders, and something goes wrong, there's going to be a little puff of smoke more easily. So that's always been a point of tenderness in terms of trying to deal with a wide range of current draws and still give you something that is benign to a misinstalled decoder, and they do happen. Okay, and that's why we've always, our DCS100 has got a great um, low power programming track for that reason, so it's forgiving for a misinstallation. So if you want to run high current decoders, I would recommend using the booster. And then if you're running something that's not a sound decoder, doesn't draw a lot of current, then you can go back to the regular programming track and you will have less likelihood of having a miswire and install something missed to cause the decoder to be damaged. That's a personal opinion. Anyway, okay, I think that's got everything. Okay, I think we're... Come see us at the booth. Yeah, come see us at the booth. Thank you. Okay.